Our three goals for all of our master classes are to connect with other community professionals, to learn one actionable step that you can implement today, and advocate and grow the community industry. So with that said, I'm so happy to introduce our speaker, Sarah Greisdorf. Sarah, you can go ahead and turn your camera on there. And Sarah Greisdorf is a community manager at Squarespace, where she develops community strategy and works with colleagues across the company to harness the power of Squarespace's pro user base. Pro user base. So Sarah also runs Holtet, a community for recent grad women, which meets monthly across the country. And she's also been named into Boss Inno's 25 under 25 list and runs the New York City CMX chapter where she eagerly gathers local community managers in the city she now calls home. So, all right, Sarah, it's now my time to go ahead and pass it to you. So it's all yours. Go ahead, Sarah. Awesome. Thanks so much, Sujin. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and we'll get into it. All righty. Okay, I think we're all set. Um, as Sujin said, my name is Sarah, and I am super excited to be kicking off a discussion about how to get your colleagues who are not formally community managers involved in the community work that you are doing. So to kick off, um, again, my name is Sarah. As Sujin mentioned, I am a community manager at Squarespace, where I work specifically with our pro user base, which at Squarespace is described as people who build a lot of websites um, and are typically building sites for clients. So freelancers, web developers, web designers, and we call this community circle. We got Squarespace, we got circle. Um, when I am not at Squarespace, which where I've now been working full time for just over a year and a half, I also run a community called Holdet, um, which is for recent grad women. So women who are about zero to five years out of college with the goal of helping ease that transition from college to adulthood. So we now run nine chapters across the country where women meet monthly. Um, just such a privilege to run that group as well. And then I also run our New York City CMX Connect group um, and have just been really enjoying getting to know other community managers here locally and glad that we're doing it uh, digitally here as well. Um, and then lastly, I put Aspirational New Yorker. I've heard that there's two ways you can become a New Yorker. One is by living here for 10 years um, and the other is by having a rat run over your feet. And I have not lived here for 10 years. I'm about 15 months in and I managed to go 15 months without rats running over my feet. So um, we're leaving it as an aspirational New Yorker, but I'm originally from just outside DC in Bethesda, Maryland, and I uh, went to school in Boston. So really just hitting all the major East Coast cities. Um, Love that people are putting where they are from in the chat. Would love to know what you're hoping to get out of this session. Um, we got a lot of chat interaction coming uh, your way. So um, yeah, just kick it off by letting me know what you're looking for. Um, and yeah, we'll make sure we cover it. And if I don't, um, please feel free to utilize the Q&A. Um, we'll have at least 15 minutes, if not more, at the end to get to that. So um, yeah, super excited. And we're going to go ahead and dive in. So three uh, kind of main parts of our agenda today. The first is the why. Why are we gathering um, our non-community colleagues together in support of the community? How can we get them more engaged with the work that we're doing on the community side of things? And then we'll leave time, as I mentioned, for a Q&A. Love seeing the answers come in the chat. Feel free to keep sending them. So yes, starting out with the why. Why do we need to get our colleagues from across the organization involved in community work? Um, and so I wanna start by answering the question, how do we bridge the gap between your community and your uh, company? So for the sake of this presentation, community building I'm defining as the work that strengthens your community or otherwise helps you accomplish um, the goals that you've set as a community team. And as community managers, you're probably the main point of contact um, for your community members to your company. But there is so much work that your colleagues are doing that has the power to strengthen your community and amplify your impact as a community manager. So in this presentation, we'll cover how to increase the number of touch points that your colleagues um, that don't work directly with your community can have with them um, and doing that in service of getting the outcomes that you're really looking for, um, whether that's bringing the community together or accomplishing certain projects or getting buy-in. So um, 
I want to start by asking, why do you want to get your company involved in the work that you're doing? Maybe you want them to build feature requests that your community is asking for. Maybe you need their support for new projects. Maybe you need money for new activations. Um, ultimately, um, if you actually want support from your colleagues, you need to know why you're starting out and what it is that you're looking for from them. So at Squarespace, um, we are always looking to get lots of buy-in from lots of different people, but I'm going to focus um, a lot of this presentation specifically on the product org. Um, we have, I like to say, two and a half community managers at Squarespace. So we have two folks full-time um, doing community management, and then um, our new hire, shout out to McKenna, who um, we share a little bit with our content team. So um, my specific work focuses a lot on uh, collaboration with our product org. And so that's really what a lot of this is going to center around, but I think it's directly applicable to a lot of teams. So at Squarespace, the things that we're often trying to get buy-in for are um, feature requests, resolving bugs that the community is raising um, and identifying, and then getting our product org to be more transparent in sharing product updates, like what's on our roadmap, what's coming next with our community. Um, all of these things ultimately strengthen our community and the connection that our community members have with each other and with us. When we build things that they want or get bugs resolved or share what we're co what's coming next, um, we build the trust that they have in Squarespace and create more connection points that community members can have with one another as they increase discussion around what we're sharing. Um, but ultimately, accomplishing none of these three things um, and lots of the other things that we're trying to do at any given time can be done solely by our community. Um, despite having a bachelor's in computer science, I am not an engineer. I am not a product manager. I cannot build the feature requests myself. I cannot resolve the bugs. We need um, help from our colleagues to do um, the work that our community wants us to do. And so I said we'd use the chat a lot. So would love folks to just go ahead and share in the chat what's something that you are trying to um, accomplish that you might need cross-org buy-in for, um, whether that's from product or from marketing engineering or like anyone across the org, um, what's something that you maybe need to collaborate with other people on? You can go ahead and throw that in the chat. Um, definitely encourage you to engage. Um, everything will kind of build on each other. So um, looks like Eric is trying to scale their community framework across multiple locations, marketing to nonprofits, resources, product development. Yeah, all kinds of things. We can't do it ourselves, um, despite uh, community teams being very mighty. Um, so now that we've identified that, we're going to start um, by getting into the how. So once you know what you're trying to accomplish, we can go about finding ways to bridge that gap um, between your non-community management colleagues and your community. So the first way that um, you can start to bridge that relationship is by creating a menu of options that stakeholders can utilize to understand what options even exist for engaging with your community. Um, we're going to want to specifically position these around how they benefit um, the folks that are engaging, not necessarily how they benefit the community, although obviously the ways that we want folks to engage are going to benefit the community. But we want to start by creating a really clear list of ways that folks can engage with you um, so that they can then share that with their teams. So here's a little bit what this looks like at Squarespace. I put together this deck that I call So You Want to Work with Circle, which again is the name of our community. Um, and this helps folks understand how they can engage and engage with and utilize um, our community members. So I have um, just another one slide from that presentation here. And as you can see, there's a lot of different menu options that we give our product counterparts and you know, folks across the org. Um, and I'll touch on a couple of these and how to kind of accomplish them in your, in your own company. But um, each slide in this presentation covered one of the options that are listed here, one of the seven. Um, and this makes it extremely easy for stakeholders to understand their options and in a format that's easily distributable. Um, having it in a slide deck, we're a big slide deck company here at Squarespace, um, means that I can send it to various folks, they can send it out to their colleagues, so the information is distributed really easily. And then each of these slides that covered um, each one of these topics included like what it was, um, what the lift was from them, what they needed to give me to accomplish one of these things, how long it would take, and then what the impact was going to be. So um, if you want to run a beta and launch something early, um, this is what the impact is going to be. If you just want to post something on our forum, this is like what you can expect. Um, and so, yeah, made it really easy to distribute out. The second of my 
10 suggestions is to bring your non-community stakeholders right to you and right to your community. So the second creating opportunities for your colleagues to be where the conversation is happening. At Squarespace, anyone at our company has access to our forum, and we encourage them to visit regularly to see what the latest discourse is. That being said, we also have guardrails. So the purpose of our platform, which is really peer-to-peer -peer discussion, um, is not muddled. We don't let just anyone post on the forum at any given time because that would probably create the expectation that our product managers are always listening and then that's a good idea. It's like a good idea to post feature requests, which it's not. We don't uh, have a way through the forum to, to collect all that information. So we for the most part, leave our forum as pretty view only instead of like for engagement. But everyone at the company has access to see what the conversation is happening um, on the forum, which is where our community is primarily in, uh, engaging. So um, back to the chat, would love to know whether your stakeholders have access to the place where your community is engaging, or is it just the community team that has access to those conversations that are happening? Go ahead and drop your answer in the chat. Yes, Brittany says many have access, but don't utilize it. I'm familiar with that concept as well. Um, oh, good. A lot of people are saying all. Oh, awesome. Yes, the lack of engagement. Okay, cool. So we can get um, a little bit more into that and, and engagement um, maybe when we get to the Q&A. But I think making sure that folks like even have access to in the first place, um, especially new hires. I found that um, in some of our like various other teams that aren't our community team, if someone like hasn't been informed that we have this forum, they're never going to set up an account. So getting into those um, kind of onboarding flows is really important for us. So, all right, moving on. Um, one of the newest ways that my team has streamlined the process of getting updates to our community um, is by creating templates and an easy system for stakeholders to share updates with our community. If we want others to participate in our efforts to notify the community about things that are coming, um, you need to make it really easy for them. Um, we found that we were kind of pushing for a long time. We were like, oh, like tell the community about this. Like you should include this in our weekly release notes, do a forum post about it. But for the most part, product managers are not copywriters. And so I think this task seemed really daunting. And so we went and created a couple templates. Um, this is just a quick overview. So on the left, you can see the form that anyone um, can submit and that connects directly to an Asana board that we have that creates a new task whenever someone submits a request. Um, and then on the right, you can see part of the template that we have for a forum announcement. So forum is where we announce like all major product updates and major campaigns. And if we want people to be submitting there uh, so that we can share it with the community, we had to make this really easy. So um, as I mentioned, not everyone who we want to be doing the writing is necessarily a copywriter. So we stuck with a template and it's, you know, what are you launching? Why are you launching? What platforms is this launching to? Um, and this really lowered the barrier on getting content out the door. Um, I'll touch on circling back on feedback that comes from these posts in a couple slides. But the main takeaway here is that if you want folks to participate in your efforts, um, which and for us was notifying the community about things that are coming out, then you really need to make it uh, very easy for them to do so. Um, yeah, thank you for the circling back, McKenna. Um, my favorite pun. Okay. So the fourth uh, thing that we'll talk about today is um, connecting your colleagues and your community members by literally facilitating face-to-face -face conversations. We as community members, community managers, um, can communicate the needs of our community to our colleagues till we're like blue in the face. But at Squarespace, there's only so much value to having us as the community managers communicate things. And I found that messages are communicated so much more powerfully when we just let our folks uh, that work at our company connect directly with community members. Um, I found that these discussions are particularly valuable during prioritization and discovery um, when it comes to the product org, um, because that's when they're figuring out what to build. And I can say, you know, a hundred times that this is what the community wants, but hearing the specific use case of a community member walk through that, um, I found to just be so much more impactful. And I'll, I'll talk in a couple slides about one way to kind of like do this a little bit more at scale. But um, 
yeah, I think the more touch points that your um, team can have directly with the community um, and the more times that they can hear that, the more likely it is that what the community wants is actually going to go ahead and get built. So go ahead and share in the chat. Um, how often do you think your community talks to folks outside of the community team right now? Um, being the sole communication point means that everyone else at your company is relying on you to share everything on behalf of your community, but you're just one person, or maybe you have a small team if you're lucky. Um, and so by increasing the number of touch points that your community and your colleagues are having, um, you're able to distribute knowledge on your community's needs more effectively. Um, okay, we're all over the place. Weekly, rarely, daily, um, not enough, weekly. Yeah, so it looks like we're a little bit all over the place. I love the folks that are saying weekly. That's incredible. Um, and if you're in more of the, you know, quarterly, once a half, rarely um, category, then um, yeah, maybe start to find some more opportunities for um, these audiences to talk. All right, so let's keep going. So while customer interviews are an incredibly valuable tool, um, they also can be time consuming. So aggregating existing conversations um, can be a lighter lift way to sometimes accomplish a similar goal. Um, our forum at Squarespace has been around for a while. And so there's a lot of conversations, but not all of those conversations are always captured right in the moment when somebody posts. So sometimes people post feature requests or um, they post feedback on a product. But if that's not something we've just released, least, it's harder for us to just capture all of it, given the volume of content that's coming in on our forum. And so at Squarespace, um, we regularly pull together a lot of things for our coworkers from discussions that are previously happening on the forum or in calls that we've had. And so these can range from feature requests for product managers, reception of product launches, um, discussion of existing products, across our offerings. Um, and this format is great because it means that we don't have to spend more time collecting that new research, um, but it also can be more comprehensive than just what we as community managers remember off the top of our head. So for example, we have a product called Squarespace Scheduling, which allows you to um, book appointments and schedule your time. I could name like three or four product um, like feature requests that I know that the community wants off the top of my head because they're the ones that come up really often. But there's probably a lot more that have been discussed on the forum that I'm not always going to remember. Um, we have a lot of different products at Squarespace, and not all of my job revolves around just seeing um, what the community wants. So aggregating comments that have already been on our forum or um, that we took notes on from a previous call that we can all pull into one place um, is really helpful. And we've started to do this at a slightly more regular cadence. So now we've gotten to the point where when we're starting you know, 2023 planning, um, or planning for the next half, I have product managers reach out and they're like, okay, Sarah, I need a list of like, you know, the top 10 things that are discussed that the community really wants for commerce or for our member areas product. And so I can then take the conversations that I've had in the past and pull comments from the forum together and then aggregate that into one list that I can then deliver to the product manager and they can use that as an input for prioritization for the next things that they are going to build. Okay, great. So um, we are fortunate at Squarespace and in our circle community to have a really great group of super engaged community members who we call our circle community leaders. Um, this is a group of about 30 folks. And um, one of the ways that we engage with this group is through monthly calls. Um, and this is one of my favorite things to offer product managers or customer insights managers um, because it's a free research session for them. At Squarespace, we compensate folks for their time, especially if they're doing you know, customer research or customer interviews or something like that. But we already compensate our community leaders through our circle program. And so by giving product managers or customer insight managers a hour with this audience, um, they're getting feedback from super engaged users and they don't have to pay for it. So whereas an hour of time with 12 to 15 um, customers might cost a couple hundred dollars, um, under normal circumstances, they're basically able to do it for free. Um, free in quotes because we're compensating them in other ways, but um, for them it's free and um, it's just such a great place to um, 
kind of test things out. Um, and it's kind of a win-win. So we actually list um, small group discussions with Squarespace team members as a benefit to the this group as well. And so it, it both audiences are kind of benefiting. Um, the community gets to talk to Squarespace, Squarespace gets really great insights, and in turn, the community is strengthened because they got to hear directly from the um, folks that are working on the projects products that they're using every single day. So um, this has been really, really fruitful. And one of the ways that we've been using it more recently is, um, like an even before beta test preview of some things that we're launching. So if we have something that's launching, you know, even as far out as three to six months from now um, that we're not ready to give to all users, we can go to this group um, and especially during this monthly call and, you know, get their insights, um, ask them some questions, get feedback that can ultimately really affect the um, kind of end product. And this is so great for, even the health of the community, because then they can say, oh, I know that I gave that feedback, um, you know, three months ago when we had this call and how cool that it made it into the final product. And that just buys like so much goodwill with the community. Um, so yeah, one of my favorite ways and also just engaging with community leaders on a regular basis is like a good way to keep goodwill um, kind of piling up. Uh, our community leaders are folks who are generally pretty active on our forum as well. So when we keep them happy, the larger community is happy. So it's kind of a trickle down effect of, um, you know, we had folks internally engage with this audience. Now they get to kind of bring their um, passion for Squarespace out to the larger community. Um, I see a question. I'm not totally checking the chat, but I do see a question about an NDA. Um, all of our circle members uh, sign our terms of participation, which include a confidentiality clause. So um, we release things all the time early to this community, to the to the larger community. Um, and uh, those sometimes come out, you know, a day or a week or even a month before they go out to our general user base. Um, but because they have signed the terms of participation, um, it, it works as an NDA. All right. So my seventh suggestion, um, another one that is very mutually beneficial, is creating opportunities for the community to help engineer squash bugs. So we have a wonderful QA team at Squarespace, but we're also, you know, a, a software company and bugs happen. And um, I think instead of letting them be a negative, we've tried to turn it into a positive at Squarespace. So um, as I just mentioned, we do release products sometimes early to our circle community. And um, something that usually ends up happening is we'll post on the forum and we'll be like, oh, we're super excited to announce, you know, Shape Blocks, which is a recent one. Um, and then the community will say, oh, we're so excited about Shape Blocks, by the way, um, you know, this thing and this thing um, aren't quite working. And so they'll report the bug. It'll show up on the forum. We'll then go back to the product and engineering team that launched this. And uh, we'll say, hey, the community identified this bug. And they'll be like, great, thank you so much for telling us. Then they'll go and fix it. Then we go back to get, get to go back to the community and say, thank you so much for helping us identify this bug. Um, we went and fixed it. And thank you for like helping us strengthen our product. And then they feel great because their voice was heard. And the engineering team feels great because the product that they're releasing um, eventually to all users is less buggy. And so you know, community's happier, engineers are happier, kind of a win-win. Um, I think, you know, there was a period of time where before we started kind of, I don't want to say capitalizing on this, but like kind of making the most of, of the reality um, where, you know, the community was frustrated that we were releasing product with products with bugs because we did not have the direct feedback loop where we said, oh, you reported this, we're going to go fix it. Now we have a thank you for submitting this, the fix will be out in 48 hours. Getting the buy-in from both sides took a while, but we've gotten to a point where the community learns that we're like pretty receptive to their feedback. And so they're more willing to give it and then feel heard. And then the community is strengthened. Um, okay, we're back to the chat again. Um, what is something that your community regularly gives feedback on that you can use to get other teams involved? Is it features? Is it bugs? Is it programs that get launched by your company? Um, is it various campaigns? There, there's probably like at least one to two, if not more things that your community is like always telling you about. Um, are you actively passing that feedback onto the teams that it's relevant to? Or are you 
manage it as a community manager. I would say, you know, the more that you can invite others into that process, the more successful you're going to end up being. Um, yeah, seeing a lot of bugs and features. Um, so yeah, I think that's pretty typical, especially for, you know, software and tech companies. Um, all right, so feel free to keep those answers coming. Um, we're gonna move on to number eight. So on the other side of bug squashing is when it's all positive and we get to share positive feedback on launches that happen. Um, everyone likes when a launch goes well. Um, I think especially the people that like this are the product managers who released um, the product. People like knowing that their things are well received and um, demonstrating positive outcomes from launches reinforces the idea that your community is valuable and um, continues to enforce the idea that they should be launching things to your community or have some you know, specific marketing component of your launches to your community. Um, again, this is one of those things where like, if the product is well received, it strengthens the community because we show that like we're building things that they care about and um, that we're like receptive to them. And it goes well for the product managers as well because the product that they just spent, you know, two to six months working on was received well. Um, I have a nice little screenshot from a time that we did this recently. I think I mentioned the shape block that we launched um, the other week. And yeah, just nice to like say a lot of love, some cool ideas for the shape block in the circle forum post and just getting to drop that in the Slack channel where, where folks have been monitoring this launch and just say like, Hey, you guys did a really good job. The community really loves it makes them want to engage with the community more. Um, and I think to get to the point where like they're playing this active role on like building what the community wants um, starts with like just having the community start to play a role in the things that they're already launching. Um, cool. So, uh, number nine is kind of continuing the theme of bridging that gap. And this one is a little bit outside of product. This is more on marketing side. Um, but finding ways to, um, kind of make the community feel special when you're launching something new, um, that's a pretty easy lift for a marketing team. So, Something that we've been trying to do more is have a specific angle to the campaigns that we're launching. So recently we launched Fluid Engine, which is our new drag and drop editor. This will be my one and probably not final um, plug for Squarespace. Um, our new editor is phenomenal. I was just using it again this week and it's just like so powerful. Um, so we're gonna build a website, do it on Squarespace. Um, but going back to what the actual point of this slide is, um, we had lots of campaign emails about Fluid Engine, but when we were emailing our community specifically, we just changed the logo at the top to say Squarespace Circle instead of just Squarespace. And this is like such an easy lift, but like one, makes the community feel special, and two, allows your marketing team to see um, what the impact of your community is on their metrics by separating out this audience to get their own email, which a lot of the time just involves like duplicating the email in whatever um, email provider you use and just swatch, swapping out the image. But Separating out your community allows them to say, wow, the community is so engaged, hopefully, on email. Look, the click-through rate's higher, the open rate's higher, they're engaging more. The impact of our marketing maybe is more successful on this audience. Um, and then they're going to want to continue to keep doing it. And the community feels like heard and listened to because you, you know, popped their name at the top. It's not complicated, but it goes a long way as far as making them kind of feel special. Um, if your community is your entire business, um, I think there's still ways that you can do this um, by like, you know, calling out specific users or calling out the impact that your users are having on your product um, in your marketing as well. All right, we're almost home. Uh, so last piece of guidance uh, is to know your numbers. I think that you probably can't go to a presentation um, by a community manager without talking about data um, because at the end of the day, that quantitative feedback just hits different. So um, I think it's so important to keep data that you know is compelling for getting the outcomes that you want on hand. We're really fortunate to have a couple dashboards that keep that data ready for us. But if a product manager is wondering like why they should build the thing that you want or that your community wants or why, um, 
you know, they should prioritize a um, certain release over another or why they should launch early to your community. Getting to say, hey, did you know that, our, that folks who engage with our community like are more successful on our platform? They drive more business. They, um, you know, do have better outcomes. That's really compelling. So obviously you want to have numbers on hand that are the right numbers uh, and that like to tell a good data story. But um, at Squarespace, there's kind of two numbers that I feel like we always go back to, and that's percent of business created by those in the community, and then percent of new sites created by those in the community. So like, what's the monetary impact of people that are in our community? And um, what is just like the hard numbers on like, you know, the percent of, of sites that are being built? Um, again, fortunately, these numbers are like high enough to be compelling, but there's probably some angle, even if your community is getting off the ground, um, because we all know that community is a powerful um, tool in getting uh, customers to engage, um, that if you can have some of those numbers ready to go to just like throw them out whenever you need to make a compelling case, um, that can be really valuable. Um, it's also great to kind of show the impact of their work on your user base. So if we launch something brand new like Fluent Engine or we launch a new product, um, it's really great to then be able to go in and say, oh, look, um, did you know that, you know, of the you know 5000 people that used this yesterday, 40 percent of people are in the community. Wow. They have like an outsized impact on the success of this launch. And we probably like, probably should like continue to listen to their feedback. So. Having the data on hand is really important. Um, no matter what um, you kind of have access to, figuring out what you can pull that is going to tell that compelling data story is always going to be um, more impactful than just a simply qualitative um, report. Just saying, you know, they want this feature versus like, did you know 40% of users who use this feature are in our community? That's going to, you know, tell a stronger story um, and benefits your community because you're, you know, working harder on their behalf. So that was uh, the roundup of the 10 ways that you can kind of bridge the gap between your company and your community. Um, it really comes down to building more opportunities for them to talk and engage. I find that there's like none, no one in our community that doesn't like talking to people at Squarespace, um, whether that's us directly or folks across the org. And so finding more opportunities for them to interact, to pull other people into the work that you're doing through your community is just going to strengthen the efforts that you're doing. Um, I said it at the beginning, I'll say it again. You can't do it all yourself. I know I sometimes wish that I could. We'd probably maybe sometimes move faster, but you can't. And so create these opportunities, make them really easy. Um, um, bring the bring your non-community colleagues to the community and you'll get where you're going. Want to, you'll get where you want to go a lot faster. Um, so before we dive into q and A, I'll just say, please stay in touch. I loved um, kind of getting this conversation going. Um, I tweet about community um, and I also share insights on LinkedIn. So definitely send me a connection request. Let me know that you were um, you know, here today. Would love to keep the conversation going. Um, and yeah, tweet at me, um, ask me questions. Let's just like keep chatting because I could probably talk about this um, for a lot longer. But all right, time for all the A's for the Q's. Do we have some, some questions, Sujin? Absolutely. Well, thanks so much, Sarah. That was Absolutely amazing. Love the slide deck too. Um, for everyone who's here, just a reminder, we do have our Q&A tab on the right hand side of your screen and you can also upvote the questions that you want answered. And I'll go ahead and as people are either submitting their own questions or upvoting, the most upvoted question we've received is, can you tell us about the different ways you compensate your community for participating? Yeah. So we actually just put together a guide on what you should pay circle members um, that's internal. But um, for the community leaders, we don't like directly pay them monetarily, but we have, I think, I don't know, maybe eight or 10 different benefits for them. The main one is that we comp their site. So everyone who's a community leader has a website. Um, and so we comp that site for their term as a community leader, which is one year, if you're in good standing, two years. 
Um, we give them access to these small group discussions. We have a club, which is like just a mini forum on our forum that's just for their discussions. Um, and we give them like a badge. We give them a blurb for LinkedIn, kind of ways for them to market. Um, the web design industry is like pretty full. And so finding ways for you to kind of differentiate yourself does go a long way. So the badge, um, the LinkedIn blurb are really helpful. Um, those are the ones that immediately come to mind. Oh, and we give them access to Marketplace, which is a place where you can hire Circle members. Um, we don't let, like, we have a lot, a lot of people in our community. So we have, like, a specific subset of people that we let go on Marketplace so that clients can find them. Um, and we give them access to that. Um, and then as far as, like, otherwise compensating community members, we have, like, set prices for, like, how much we pay them for writing a blog post for us or being in a webinar or um, something like that. So that, the rest of that is, like, all monetary compensation. Amazing. Perfect. And another question we got is opportunities are one thing, but how do you encourage hesitant colleagues to see the value in this kind of engagement? Yeah, I think that it's something that happens, unfortunately, like pretty slowly. Um, I've been at Squarespace for a year and a half and there's like still people I'm trying to get on board. And I think a lot of that comes from the fact that, you know, for the first night, uh, 15 years of Squarespace is history. We were like a strictly DIY um, focused company. And now we have what we call our DIFM users that do it for me, the, those pros. And it's kind of hard to switch people's mindset. And so just like it's hard to get them on board for this whole another user group, it can be hard to get people on board for uh, community as well. But I think it's about pairing that qualitative insight with the quantitative insight. So what feedback are you getting from your community that kind of tells a compelling story? And how can you kind of front load positive um, encouragement back to these people? Um, so then eventually you get buy-in for like slightly harder things with them. So for example, going back to like sharing positive feedback, if you launch something and your community loves it, you should tell them. If like we saw a bug inadvertently and the community had reported it, tell them. Like, let's just like, you know, start the cycle of um, like positive feedback. Um, I know that like as an industry, I feel like we're like probably underappreciated by our community. A lot of times we have the like, don't shoot the messenger. Like that's the phrase, but a lot of times it's like shoot the messenger, like community manager always in the line of fire, but um, it feels so good to be appreciated, doesn't it? And so you can play that role as an internal community manager back to your colleagues in kind of like encouraging them in the work they're doing and then getting them on board for um, kind of meeting some more of those customer uh, and community demands. Right. And speaking of feedback and communication, you know, one is asking what sort of things should the community team report back to the to the company management and um, and employees besides member growth and social media post responses? Mm, yeah. So um, but those are two interesting examples um, because they are kind of more like health metrics of the community. Um, ideally, your number of community members is like always going up unless there's a way for people to leave. But at Squarespace, once you become a circle member, you're always a circle member. So that number always goes up for us. So it's not really like an impactful number as far as like what the impact is. So um, I think I said previously, but we try to report on like what the impact of uh, the business is like mon the community is on the business monetarily. So what um, percentage of sites are they build are built by folks in the community, um, and then what is like the dollar amount of the business that they're driving as best as you can measure it. And then I think if you can, like on a product by product basis, be able to say, you know, oh, like at Squarespace, for example, oh, like, you know, X number of sites were like created yesterday. Oh, can you believe that like 20% of them were created by the community when the community makes up a much smaller percentage than our user base? So I think finding opportunities and they also need to be relevant to the audience. So like a marketing manager probably won't care that the circle, that like our circle community is impacting the specific product, but they would want to know, um, you know, what is the like, social reach of our community. You know, you kind of have to like tailor it to the audience that you are looking to reach. But yeah, again, pairing that qualitative and quantitative feed, um, data is so important. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned the circle community. Would you, would you know why it's called the circle community? 
Um, I think it's like a play on Squarespace, um, but that name was created much before my time. Got it. <laughs> Thanks. I just thought to throw it out there. Um, in turn, we and continuing on communication. Um, one, Kelly's interested to know if you have other subsets of the businesses of the business that you deal in a similar nature. So how do you avoid over communication and keep track of the touch points you're having with your community leaders across the businesses? Mm, great question. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, like I mentioned, a majority of my work is with our product org, but um, we, I love the question about over communication because honestly, I don't think we've like ever thought about that um, <laughs> only because they were so under communicated with before. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I think it's about like streamlining the ways that you're communicating so that it's clear where to get information from. So mm -hmm. um, we communicate directly to our community in um, like three main ways. One is through our monthly newsletter that goes out obviously once a month that has kind of like a roundup of company updates. We have a weekly release notes that goes out to circle members every single week with mainly product updates, some community notes, and then bugs that we fixed. And then we have forum posts that get posted directly on the forum that have those product updates. Because there's only three ways to um, communicate out with the community, we've streamlined the ways that we then go out to internal folks to get those updates. So mm -hmm. we have that form um, that's just like a good way for people to like input things um, into that content that we need from them. And I would say we message that out on kind of like a one one to one basis or like when people reach out to us, we like send it to them. Um, we also have an internal newsletter that we send out once a month that is like good company updates in general. But a lot of the work is really on like a one-on-one -on -one basis. So um, mm -hmm. if someone was like, oh, I, if a community member was like, oh, I really want this feature, it's like me going directly to that PM and being like, oh, the community wants this. Have we thought about building it? And so it's not like a lot of bombardment. It's like, kind of on a one-on-one -on -one basis, unless they're then reaching out to us and being like, oh, I want a roundup of these things. And then it's like collecting that information and giving it back to them. So to yeah. be honest, we've yet to hit the point where I think we're over communicating. I feel like we have to like message about our community all the time. Um, yeah. And that's how you kind of get in front of them. But like kudos to anyone that is concerned about over communication. <laughs> Definitely, we are all on the same boat. Um, in terms of kind of creating a pitch to your internal community. So one is asking, um, we're relaunching our community and many of our internal experts have knowledge we need them to share on the community, but how do we make it sound exciting and useful to them? Uh, I have a follow up question to that person. I'm not sure if it's possible to like get a follow like, to do that, but um, the insights we need to get from internal folks out or we need to, or is that not the direction? Do you know, Sajin? Uh, let's see. It's look, it seems as if they're asking how you get them to participate, how you ask your internal colleagues to participate in getting engaged. Oh, cool. Okay. Yeah. yeah that one. So um, that's why we have the deck that I touched on right at the beginning, which has those like seven ways to get engaged. Um, and as I mentioned, each of the slides that touches on one of those ideas um, leads with what the benefit is to them. Um, so if you're doing, you know, a, an early access um, release, the benefits are that um, we catch bugs early, we get feedback earlier, et cetera. Um, if you're, it's like, you know, aggregating forum, forum information, the benefit is that like, they don't have to go do net new research. The burden of a lot of that work is on our community team, but it was um, like, we make the, the, we make the ways for other uh, colleagues to engage really easy, really lightweight and like lead with the benefits. Um, and then just like hammer at home all the time. There's a couple like different forums that we have internally. Like we have like a, weekly, uh, sorry, monthly product meeting. We have one for like our commerce org. I've gone and presented this deck in those places and then have made that content like readily available. Um, and so 
the more that you can kind of get in front of people, give the same content over and over again, it'll eventually get to them and then invite them to like do that. So um, when someone's launching something, when I hear about it from someone other than the PM that's responsible for it, mm -hmm. I reach out to them and I said, oh, do you want to message this to the, to the community? Should we do a forum post about this? 99% mm -hmm. of the time they're like, yes, thank you for reaching out. You know, I didn't know I needed to do this or I didn't have time to do this. Make it easier for them. Just come, go to them and be like, I think we should tell the community about this. They're not going to say no, probably. So yeah. At least they rarely do to me. So um, yeah, go to them, make it easy, um, lower the barrier to do it. Nice. Perfect. Well, we have a few questions about, uh, so when it comes to bugs, so how do you hand the, handle the relationship between whether it's a bug or not, or even support teamwork? Um, yeah, so two things there. Um, I don't know if something's a bug or if that's how it was designed, but the engineers do. So right. I think there was a question in the chat earlier about like where bugs are reported. So um, when it's a brand new release, like if we launch something today only to the community, um, we would expect people to be responding in the forum thread with the bugs. Um, usually we have an expectation that within the first like week, product managers and engineers who worked on the release are looking at that thread. And so they're going and like identifying bugs. And if it feels like they're not, I'll message them and I'll be like, is this a bug? Is it? And then the product manager knows if it's a bug or not. So that's mm -hmm. how kind of how we do that. If it's not a brand new release, we don't really encourage bug reporting on the forum. That's what our customer care team is for um, because they have a whole system for logging bugs that we don't. Um, we've kind of educated the community on this. So now we're at a point where like, even if new community members come along and they're like, I'd like to report a bug, someone will usually respond to be like, please write into customer care about this. Like the community mm -hmm. manager, Sarah's not like fixing the bug for you. Um, Cause I literally don't have the ability to do that. So. <laughs> Um, yeah, generally try to route, route them to customer care unless it's a bug related to a brand new release. But yeah, I don't know if it's a bug or a feature, but the PMs do. So I just go mm -hmm. to them. So continuing that conversation on what that communication cycle looks like in terms of the product. So how do you close the loop with the product, especially when it comes to product ideas or feature requests? Does the community manager manage ideas um, and the, the direct messaging with that? Yeah, you know, it's an interesting question and one that honestly, like very welcome to suggestions on how other people have set it up because we don't have a great system at this time for collecting feature requests. Mm. Um, and like being sure that they're being accounted for by our product manager. So for the most part, um, they just get suggested like on the forum or someone will bring it up in a call. And we let like generally just let it like live on the forum, live wherever, wherever it was originally collected. And then when product managers reach out and they're like, what are the you know top things that the community wants? Then we'll aggregate it. Something I have been trying recently that I'd be curious if anyone else has done is um, we ha with our community leaders, I'll go to them and I'll be like, what are the like top things that you want from our commerce product? And then they submit a bunch of ideas and then I put them into a Google form and then I have people like pick their top five ideas and then I give that ranked list back to mm -hmm. the product managers. So it's not like an official feature request system um, where like people can upvote and downvote, which I know some companies have, but it was like a good like gut check kind of way to like get the community's input on what we're doing. Cats right. is all right, that's validating. <laughs> or just act as a liaison, right? In yeah, some... we're, we're more of a liaison. There's also times where like product managers will, you know, be lurk in the forum and they'll be like, oh, I noticed that the community has been asking about this. Like that's something mm -hmm. we're going to look into now. That's like ideal. But we have too many product managers at Squarespace and they're just not all doing that. They don't have time. So mm -hmm. got to do what we can do. Yeah. So I have a question about customer service managers, and um, this was upvoted a few times here. So one's asking, how do you onboard your customer service managers or CSMs teams to your community? Since community will be new for my company and building operations and processes with these with this team is vital to the success of a community program. Um, how do you do that, um, especially because they're currently in you know, deal, dealing with primary cust customer contacts, et cetera. Yeah, so we actually don't have customer service managers in 
the way that I think is being described um, at Squarespace. Um, we have two different like sides of our forum. One is um, like a public consumer side of the forum. And then one is our circle side of the forum. And on the circle side of the forum, it's just our community managers that are answering questions. And then on the um, public side of the forum, we have a new program where we have um, some of our customer service advisors going in and like marking answers as correct and like trying to provide some support there. Um, so probably unfortunately can't provide a ton of advice there, but um, I'm just looking at the question again. I think probably a lot of it comes down to like documentation. Something that I've been really impressed by that our like public side of the forum community team has been doing is like documenting everything religiously. Um, and so you have that documentation to then hand over for like how you should engage on your forum or like how to engage with the community on a regular basis. So I think the more you can probably provide for them, the better, but um, we don't have that specific role. Um, but as far as like, you know, building operations and processes, um, the more that can be documented and then iterated on probably the better. I can definitely harp on that. It's so important to have that documentation. Um, and speaking, you, you mentioned networking. And so one was asking, do you create networking events or opportunities for your community for peer-to-peer -peer engagement? Yes, I love this question because um, then I get to brag on my team a little bit. Um, we ran our very first um, pro user conference in August. Um, we had, I think, just under 1,800 attendees between in-person and online. It was amazing. It was called Circle Day. Um, and that was like our first real time since the pandemic, getting folks together. And so because that was a success, we are now in the process of getting a meetup program off the ground. So um, we're going to start by just hosting meetups here at the Squarespace office. We have um, fortunately enough space to do that um, and then hoping to eventually kind of package that framework and then uh, give that out to our community members to run events in their own city. Um, we also have had some community members run events um, in their city and online before. Um, and those have been great as well. Um, we're just trying to like be able to scale that um, by figuring out how to do it really well ourselves and then giving that out to others. Um, the forum is also like a really great place that people I know have met and connected. Um, you know, someone asks a question, you respond, you follow up in the DMs, now you have a call, now you have a friend. Um, at Squarespace, we also have like the forum that we own, but I know a lot of our community members have also started their own Facebook groups to talk about Squarespace. So I know that they're building relationships kind of outside of our purview as well, which is fine by me. The more that the community is talking, I think everyone's better off. So um, yeah, those are some of the ways that we've been connecting folks lately. Awesome. That's super exciting. Um, uh, in terms of startup companies, um, how do you get people within the company to find value in the community, especially as it's just starting out? Would you have any insight there? Yeah, I think that it's like, just to like, take a step back, fascinating to me when startups are like hiring community ma managers so early on, because clearly someone in the leadership team saw value. So um I would probably start there and be like, what are you hoping to get out of the community that we then can like, you know, pull metrics together and put reporting in place to help you? Like, what are the questions that you have that we can answer with this community? Um, but yeah, I think like if you're just a startup and you're just getting off the ground, like I'd probably figure out like, what's the purpose of your community? Like, is it to engage um, customers? Is it to drive product adoption? Um, you can look up David Spinks, co-founder of CMX. Um, he has the whole spaces model that kind of breaks down like why you would have a community. And I think you should, especially as a startup, like what are we trying to achieve at this early stage that we think that a customer community um, can help us accomplish? And then probably go from there. I think if you're already asking at a startup stage how to get buy-in, like, I already have question marks. Like, who hired the community team? Like, why did we decide to hire them? And then maybe go back to that why and then use that as the reason um, for, like, when you're trying to get buy-in. Like, our community team exists to accomplish this. Here's the data that we're starting to pull together to know if our work's successful. We're excited to, like, partner with other teams to bring that work to life is probably where I would start. That's great. Yeah. Super great questions to think about. Um, we talked about the community managers. And, and so in terms of 
marketing teams, uh, how do we help marketing friends understand how to get involved in community work? So how do we um, convey that to them? Marketing friends, not foes. Good question. Um, you know, it's so interesting because that question also assumes that the community team is not on the marketing team, which I know a lot of times it is. Um, but we're not on the marketing team. Our team sits in a department called Channels and Services. We sit with Enterprise. It's like a random, I, I've never heard of this anywhere else. But um, I think that it's finding ways for the community to be like specifically part of activation. So how can you take the metrics that they're trying to reach already and then use the power of a community to um, like influence that? So for example, we're something we do at Squarespace is that we have like a really big Super Bowl campaign and we always produce an ad with a celebrity. It's like very fun. And so we try to like get the community engaged in that by, um, you know, having specific specific email campaigns about that um, or, you know, trying to activate people in the forum or like sharing how the front site page that was built um, for that campaign, like how that was built. We share that with like our design community, that kind of thing. So like what are ways that like you can use that power of community to influence their metrics is I think probably what it comes down to. Um, anyone like wants their work to be more successful we all know the like, you know, 100 plus people on this call that community is really impactful. So what are ways that you can utilize the power of community to accomplish their metrics? Great. And I'm, I'm so glad that, you know, expanding on, we talked about the community managers and how we work with our marketing friends. And the title of the masterclass was how we make it a whole company effort. Um, one is asking, you know, who are some of the key team members to have for community management and engagement. Obviously, you know, we can't do this ourselves, as you've mentioned. Would you have any other key team members that you can talk about and how, you know, how we can truly make it a whole company effort? Yeah. Um, just to clarify, Sajin, do you know if you're talking, if um, this person asking is like asking just about like on the community team, how do we build that out or like company wide who are like good players to partner with? Why don't we expand it to the you know company wide? Um, we can just expand it there and see. Okay, cool. Yeah. So yeah, the the folks that I think we work with the most are directly with product managers. I know some companies have it where like if you do product stuff, you work directly with um, product marketing managers instead of PMs. But I found a lot of success just building relationships directly with PMs. Um, and then probably after that, we have good counterparts in the cost ops department, um, folks who are, you know, handling day to day communication with our customers, um, because in some ways, you know, they're they're also engaging with our community in different ways. Um, and then after that, we have like worked really hard to build really good relationships specifically within marketing with our like email team. Um, you can't get an email out. <laughs> to our customers without like having an entire brief about it and like having a whole write up. And so we've like worked hard to build relationships there. Um, and then mm, those are probably the ones that like immediately come to mind that we work with most on a daily basis. Again, for me, it's really product for my colleague, Sam, who does events and webinars. It's probably like cost ops a little bit. Cause there's like, we have a customer education team that I know he works with um, sometimes and then email. Those are probably like our biggest, our biggest partners. And then a lot of like ad hoc relationships, also the partnerships team, because sometimes we'll do partnerships where we engage directly with the community and we like rely on them um, for support as well. Awesome. Yes. And that person did say that it would, they were referring to company wide. So that's perfect. Um, all right. And we just have a few more minutes. So I'll probably ask one or two more questions here. Um, so let's see. Scott is asking, and this might be a very, you know, it might be a case by case situation. Um, but Scott's asking, I've heard community managers wear too many hats. So what should and shouldn't be the responsibility of the community manager? Mm. Such a great question. Um, yes, I agree that it is case by case. Yes. I would say like, what are the metrics that your community team is responsible for? And is the work that you're doing laddering into that? 
I think that we've gotten to a point because we've like really heavily marketed our community team as a resource to others in the organization where they'll sometimes say, oh, like this would be a great thing for us to bring Circle into. And we've had to kind of like take a step back and say, is this moving our metrics or is it just moving your metrics? And sometimes it's okay to just move their metrics, but maybe that's something that should be like an owned metric at that point, like a, like a co-owned, like both have you know a role in it. But if all we're doing is moving your metrics and we're not moving our metrics, then you're probably going to become overextended mm -hmm. and you're not going to be able to demonstrate the value of your community um, because you're not hitting your own numbers. So I would say start with like, what are my OKRs? What are the, my overarching goals that I want to hit You know, this quarter, this half? What are the tactics that I'm going to be um, working on that I think ladder into those numbers? And then how much time do I think that's going to take? And then once I've fully assessed the work that I need to do to support my community, what time is left to help other people um, that might not directly have an impact on my number, but you know might buy me goodwill for a project that I want to work on you know, next quarter or next half? Um, another plug for CMX is... Um, like business, I don't know what the, what the course is called, Suji. Maybe you can, maybe you remember. But they, David has another course. Oh, the that you MBA. Can take. Yes, yes, the CMX MBA. Yes, yes, the community <laughs> MBA. Yes, take it. Totally worth it. Um, David also has a book, The Business of Belonging. I feel like I sound like a fangirl. Um, <laughs> but it's all such good content. I don't oh, know yeah. to tell you. Um, <laughs> so um, that that uh, course does a really good job of kind of like breaking down how you like set your goals from top to bottom. And I think like hit your goals first and then like figure out what else you can add on to that. Amazing. That is extremely helpful. As I know, a lot of, you know, as CMs, we have so much going on. So really kind of narrowing down on those topics and those goals, super helpful. Well, Sarah, thank you so much for your wisdom. We've gotten so much great feedback. And for those who are watching and for those who couldn't make it, we will be having a recording posted and sent out um, on our CMX YouTube channel. So please be on the lookout for that. I also do want to mention that we will be having our next uh, masterclass in November. And so I'm going to be posting that um, link to register in our chat there. And we'll be having um, Piper Wilson speak at next month's masterclass. But Sarah, thank you so much once again we absolutely loved this session with you and I hope to see everyone at our next one. See awesome. Next Thanks so much, everybody. Bye. Bye.